Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot. More saving, more doing. This week, Danny's on vacation, but I have a special co-host joining me, Chelsea Lipford-Wolf. That's right. I hope Dad is enjoying a Bahama vacation, much deserved, but I'm glad to be here. We help a caller out who lives in Arizona and gets sun on her front doors all the time, and so we have some tips on refinishing those front doors. Yeah, she had sent along some pictures, and the doors actually look like they're in pretty good shape. Just the bottom half or so seemed badly faded. And, uh, yeah, so we share a couple of tips on how to... um, get those doors looking good without removing them from the hinges. Um, We also got a caller that has trouble removing some particle board that was glued down to a concrete slab. So he's not sure what to do. He's been scraping it off with a hammer and chisel, but we offer um, another solution which requires renting a tool, but it'll make the job go much, much quicker. And then we have another caller from Wyoming who is already thinking about snow and how to keep the snow off of her front porch or um, the entrance to their home. So um, Joe helps her out with that. Yeah, I I deal with snow on my front porch all the time, so I know what she's talking about. And I've got a simple solution on how to use a garden hose to lay out a garden path, right? Because ordinarily you want a path that has a little bit of curve or shape to it, not just a straight line. And I've got a really good tip on using the garden hose to lay out the shape of the pathway. If you have a question about your home, get in touch with us, 800-946-4420. At just as Catherine has, Catherine's calling us from Arizona. She has a question about her front door. Hello, and welcome to the show. Hey. Hey, how you doing? I'm doing good. Okay. Our solid-ass front doors are on the northwest side of our home, and they haven't been finished in 35 years. Wow. And I'm concerned about protecting them from the Arizona afternoon sun. Yeah, Joe, okay. yeah. Catherine sent pictures, and oh my goodness, these doors are beautiful. Oh, yeah, I see these here. Oh, wow, yeah, highly done. Did you say these are ash doors? Yes, they're oh, ash. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure what you said there for a second. Ago. <laughs> I must um, admit, I giggled a little bit. <laughs> and you said they were... Not that they're unfinished, they just haven't been refinished right, in 30 years. Right, they haven't oh, okay. been finished in a long time. Well, well, Chelsea lives in a very sunny part of the world, right. um, as you do, so maybe she has some suggestions. So you want to, you do want to refinish them. Have you, so you have, did you fin- refinish them last time, or you've? No, no, this home was my parents. Okay. And they built it 35 years ago. Okay, I gotcha. Okay, so what? I've I've done I have handrails that I've refinished multiple times in the seven years that I've had been in my house, and um, the best thing that I've found is a marine grade polyurethane. Be- okay. You know because marine grade you think boats they're exposed to water, moisture, sunlight, all of the things, and right. so um, you can find it just in the home center in the paint aisle. But it's you know it's got a little picture of a boat on it, but. Okay. Um, uh, but to refinish them, Joe, you would, I mean, just do what you do for any other wood wood piece, right? Yeah, we'll have to have Brandon, our producer, um, post these, the picture online, because these are highly decorative doors. And yes, I think, details. Catherine, the challenge is going to be, you have so much applied molding to these doors. Exactly. That gonna, yeah, you don't want to remove them, obviously, remove no, the mold. No. So you're going to have to it, work your way applied. around. It's carved in. Oh, those are carved in. They're oh, solid, wow. yes. Yeah, well, that makes it even more challenging. But in any case, yeah, you're going to have to, you know, you maybe need to get a, like a oscillating multi-tool with a small yeah. sanding pad or a, a profile sander or something that fits in because some of these spaces are going to be too small for a pad sander, any kind of electric pad sand. Of course, you can always hand sand, but that's right. going to that's gonna really take a lot of time. Yeah, and Catherine, yes. I have a, a, a question. Are you ch- trying to re- st- change the color of the stain? No. I okay. just want them to be, you know, Protect because them. all the doors in the house, inside and out, and even on our guest house, are this wood. So I want to keep everything okay. the same. So it's, it sounds like you might not even, I mean, you do need to sand it a little bit, but it doesn't sound like you need to get that detailed in all of the grooves to be able to re, right. re-coat them with a polyurethane. Oh, okay. Just clean yep. them really well and then yeah. 
sand, you know, maybe some rough spots. Right. That's right. what. I, yeah. That's just. I mean, just looking at the pictures, that's what I would think. And then. Um, and, you know, in Arizona, you want to make sure you wait until the temperatures cool down because you don't want right. that polyurethane drying too fast if it's too hot outside. Right. And right. there's a there's a thing called a tack cloth, which you may have heard of. Right. You can yes. get any hard, hard... So you can use that to remove the sanding dust because obviously you don't want to apply the uh, new polyurethane over any sanding dust. And to tell you the truth, Catherine, we get people sending us photographs of doors that are really in bad shape. These don't look that bad. No. I know the bottom... No, they're not. They're just dried out, but... Yeah. I don't want them to right. get dried out more. <laughs> you, you want know? to protect yeah, it before it gets worse. I totally understand right. that. And if your front door goes missing, Catherine, it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> she may come in. <laughs> may have to do a checking in with Chelsea. Yeah, how to you, steal can doors. Can you carry no, not front doors, doors on an airplane? That's what I need to. Yeah, I'm, that, I'm, I'm that'll not be in sure my... about that. <laughs> and they're, they're pretty heavy, so shipping oh, so them maybe... might be a little expensive. <laughs> All right. I'll yeah, let you keep yeah. your front door then. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so I would I would sand them down as she's as Chelsea recommended, and try not to remove any of the stain. You know, you just want to sand the, the top coat right. finish, and then because if you sand the stain, then of course you have to come back and try to match the stain. And then put on one coat, sand it in between, put on a second coat, maybe even a third coat, right. and hopefully that'll that'll um, survive the elements. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your help, and uh, we watch your show every week. We love it. Awesome, Catherine. Well, thank you so much for saying that. Right now, we have Stephen on the line who has a flooring question. Hi, Stephen. Welcome to the show. How you doing today? Danny's on assignment? He's on assignment. He's on vacation. That's his assignment. <laughs> he's, he's in Bahamas. He rented a boat. He told me he rented a boat, and he rented a blender. I'm like, wait a minute. What kind of vacation is this? He's got a blender on his boat. Uh, that's the good kind. That's right. That's right. So how can we help I, you today, Stephen? All right. I got this lovely 1930s Midtown cottage here. Okay. And somewhere along the line, they put a concrete slab raised and for the floor, for the main subfloor. Right. Looks like they laid tar paper down and then put that old school press board. Right. Now, Product of board like, of some sort. Yeah. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then of course put the flooring and everything over that. So now I've gotten to a point where I'm all the way down to that, but I can't get this press board up. Any suggestions? Besides so, the back-breaking, uh, <laughs> put my 12-year-old yeah. to it. And, uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's always the first place to start. So so you have a concrete slab that has particle board or something like particle board glued down to the concrete, and you're trying to get that up. Yeah, and, that it, and it's done with tar paper because I'm, I'm looking at it, and it is it is tar paper. It's pretty much disintegrated now, so it's just the tar now. So I've, yeah, got, um, I've got sections of it where that tar has become brittle. Right, but there are right. other sections that it is just holding on for dear life. Yeah, I see you sent along a few photographs. We yeah. appreciate it. But, but even with this, Chelsea, it's a little hard to tell what's going on. I don't, just the word tar makes me think that sounds so messy. Yeah, Like it's, yeah. it's stuck there. Well, they do make, but it, Stephen. But it, it is dry. Okay. Yeah, good. Well, that's good. So maybe it'll, cry. it'll be a mess getting, getting this up. The first thing I thought of is you can rent. They have these floor scrapers, Stephen, you can rent. And it's like a walk behind machine. It's a little hard to describe. It has a large metal blade in front and it kind of vibrates back and forth. And it'll basically bust up almost anything. I've seen them used for tile and they just pop tile right off in a mortar. And I suspect there's, I'm sure they have one. If you go to Home Depot and check out the rental department and ask them what they have for floor scrapers, there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, you might find something because that might be the first way to go. Rent it. If you can rent it for just for an hour, rent it and just try it. You know, it might cost you 60 bucks, but at least you can, you can see if it works because that should pop it up. Now, what you're going to have left behind is going to be more of a mess. You may need to grind, you know, get a concrete grinder mm -hmm. and grind it down to the bare concrete if you need to. But other than right. that, I'm not really sure what else what else to recommend. And pretty pretty much nothing because if I were to, to go back and say use that self-leveling uh, compound, that probably right. would not be good because it, since it's wet, it would go in and start expanding that old particle board too, wouldn't it? Well, but you can't put anything on top. A... Yeah. And uh, if you want to put concrete resurfacer on top of the concrete, if you needed to, you could do that. But, yeah, know, this particle board's got to come up. I mean, there's, there's uh, especially since you already started the job, it looks like through these photos, you've busted up oh, yeah. quite a bit of it. Yeah. Yeah. So I think you might have to, uh, like I said, get one of those um, rent one of those floor scrapers, those big floor scrapers, and I'm, I'm sure that would get you through that part. And the good thing is particle boards, especially old particle boards, not going to put up much resistance. 
Yeah, so, True. Joe, instead of renting, uh, we've used a, I call it a chipping hammer. Right. So it's the same thing, but it's smaller. With a wider it, blade? Right. I guess it would yeah. do the same thing, though. Yeah, it would. It would take a little longer. How big right. is this area, by the way, Steve? How large a room are we talking about? 13 by 13. Yeah, so it's not that big. So you might be able to, uh, it would be certainly be cheaper to rent uh, a chipping hammer or some kind of demolition hammer that has a wide blade, not a pointed tip, obviously. Right. As, as Chelsea recommended. Okay. You bust that up. You know to wear I, eye I, goggles I, and hearing protection and dust mask and all that. Because who knows what's in that adhesive or yeah. that, what you're calling tar. It might be have asbestos in it, which you probably should have checked as well. I mean, that that could be, you know, that, that could be um, a problem as well. Or actually, I got a better deal. <laughs> okay. How about you guys? Uh-oh. You want me to buy your house, Stephen? Yeah. Is that it? <laughs> no, just let's do a show. Okay. <laughs> well, if you, if you want to lure if you want to lure Danny back from vacation, I don't think this is the right project to do it. Okay. I like it. We'll, I, we'll let our what, what oh, we'll if, let our producers know about that one. Yeah. What if what if I kick in daiquiris? Da- okay, oh, we'll see. All right. All right. So yeah. can I come can I come over at noon, Stephen? Or is that too soon? <laughs> you know. Chelsea, you just check in with me whenever you're ready. Okay. <laughs> All right, Stephen. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. All right. So okay. now it's time for our best new product brought to you by the Home Depot. More saving, more doing. While fighting weeds is a year-round job, weed prevention is best practiced in the fall. So get get ready now and early spring to take full advantage of the growing season of your turf grasses. If you see a weed sprout in your guard bed, lawn, or driveway, be sure to fight back with Natria Grass and Weed Control. With this in your arsenal, you'll be able to kill tough weeds, root and all, within minutes. Natria doesn't only work great on weeds and grass, but it will also eliminate moss, algae, brush, and vines in an instant. Plus, any area you are working in can be re-sown five days after treatment. So for more information on Natria Grass and Weed Control, log on to homedepot.com. That's great. And, you know, a lot of people don't realize that the fall is the best time to plant grass seed, right? And the reason reason is that the weather's cooler, so the weeds are starting to die back, so Mm -hmm. there's less... there's less um, competition, and plus the cooler weather helps the grass grow really quickly. Let's move on to a live call. We have Linda on the line calling from Florida, and Linda has a, a tiling question, I believe. Hello, Linda. Welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you for having me. I certainly of appreciate course. it. Of course. I have a contractor that is wanting to put down tile on a subfloor, which is wood, um, right. that's linoleum down, and he's wanting just to put it right on top of the linoleum without putting dure rock. And I wanted to know if that is an acceptable uh, way to do it. Okay. So we're talking about, like, linoleum tiles that are glued down to a wood subfloor? We're talking about linoleum that's in, like, a big sheet. Okay. Um, it's, oh, okay. It's, uh, yeah. A roll. It's a roll. Yeah. Right. So it's a resilient sheeting. They call it resilient flooring. It's a sheet flooring. Yeah. Um, do you know like if this... It's 1970. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was, yeah. Because... Okay. Um, if it's if it's not fully adhered to the subfloor, that might be an issue because some newer resilient floors are not. But this was probably fully glued down. Um, but still, but it's on a wood subfloor. Be, yeah, Isn't it's on a wood. The there's a wood subfloor under it, right? Correct. Okay. Well, the thickness of it, you can to, to answer your question. Yes, you can lay tile over it. I would put down, I would definitely put down backer board, cement backer board. But it, the thing we don't know is the total thickness of the subfloor because right. it really should be at least one and a quarter inches thick. That's what's required by the National, excuse me, the Tile Council of North America. They require one and a quarter inches of subfloor. Oh. You know, it could be two pieces of half inch plywood and a quarter inch backer board or quarter inch plywood, whatever. Because if you don't have that one and a quarter inches, you're going to have flex in the subfloor. And then that, those right. tiles are going to crack and pop. So, okay. um, so okay. if, I, was, I was really concerned because he didn't want to put the backer board down. And I'm like, I want to do it right. I don't want to just do it to do it. I want to do it right. So what I understand you saying is is that it's a possibility, but it would be better to have the backer board? Yes. Or dirt rock? Okay. So if her subfloor uh, is an inch and a quarter, then backer board is not necessary? Yeah. If it's inch and a quarter, what... Um, they used to do is put down just a quarter inch plywood underlayment, which you could probably still do, but I would still prefer to put down, I wouldn't lay it right on top of the vinyl floor. That, that I'd probably not do. Then you could put down quarter inch 
backer board. But I, right. I would definitely recommend, the only reason not to put down backer board besides the expense is if it raises the floor a little bit and it might create a challenge transitioning from room to room, but there's always a way to solve that that problem, right. Linda. And um, if they put down the backer board, just make sure they do it correctly. They have to put down mortar first, uh, screw maybe that's it down. Why they don't want to do it. <laughs> they, they don't often want to do that. And then, you know, obviously you have, you have to mortar and tape all the joints and all the screw holes. So it's a little bit of work, but in the end, you want to make sure this is a rock solid floor. You don't you don't want right. the um, you know you want the tiles cracking or popping up. So it sounds like she needs yeah. Linda should insist on the backer board, even if I would it's insist an, on backer an added cost. All right, thank you. That answers my question. I, you know, that little voice inside your head that says, yeah. "No, I think it needs to be done this mm -hmm. way." And Good. of course. I don't have experience in that, but I'm like, uh, I've always known people put backer board down. So. Sure. Okay. And Linda, there's no real downside other than, like I said, if it causes a height transitioning problem from one room to the other, which you can solve with the correct transition strip. But I think you'd be better off going with the, with the backer board. All right. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. And I thank you for the opportunity. Oh, of course. Thank you for joining us. If you have any other questions, get in touch with us. We like answering a few recorded questions left by our listeners. Sometimes people, you know, they want to they want to get a question answered, but they don't have the time or the desire to join us live on the air, and that's okay. We understand. Just call the hotline 800-946-4420 and leave a message, just like these folks did. Hi, I have drywall tape along the ceiling of my house in several rooms that's cracking, I guess pulling away from the drywall, so there's a little crack along the, the edge of it. And I'm wondering what the best way to that is without ripping it all out yeah well you don't want to rip it all out if you don't have to but sometimes that is the only real permanent solution but here's what i would do first and i've tried this and it's worked more than half of the time so first you want to try um you want to try gluing it back with either white glue or even yellow carpenter's glue so you want to slip a putty knife maybe like a six inch wide putty knife behind the loosened tape and pull it down but be really careful you don't want to rip it off you want to rip it or pull it off the wall anymore and you just want to pull it down just enough to squeeze in a little glue and then um then Put the glue along the entire loosened section, press it back up in place. Then roll, if you have a wallpaper or seam roller, that's the best thing. Just roll it back and forth you know, until the glue kind of grabs. And then, you know, then you might have to hide the seam where it's pulled away with a little joint compound, and then prime it and paint it. That's the best way to, to repair it without tearing it all out. If you have to, you're going to have to cut it all out and then reinstall it. Okay, let's go to the next question. I built a Doug Ride designed home with isonine spray-in insulation, completely sealing the the building, which means that I sprayed the I or not I, but the insulator sprayed the isonine right up onto the underside of the roofing deck. I uh, am now getting a problem with my GAF roofing, and it's been declared the effective and they're going to replace it but a uh, new roofer says that i need to scrape the isonine off of the inside surface of the roof deck because that's why the roof has failed I just need to know whether or not there's any validity uh, I, do i need to go to the expense of peeling the the insulation off and then putting a, a water i mean a, a air barrier there and then reapplying it yeah, well, without knowing all of the intricate details of your specific roof, I would say that the spray insulation can trap moisture and rock, rot the decking underneath the shingles. So that could be a valid, a valid concern. Yeah, absolutely. He's, it's great that they're going to replace his roof. But yeah, we've heard about this problem in the past where it, they can't inspect the roof. If you had fiberglass insulation, you can always inspect the underside by just pulling back the insulation, but what do you do in this case? So yeah, um, it is hard to, to offer a, a solution. Okay, let's let's go to the next question. I just got through having my foundation done around the house on the garage, but there's like uh, six inches of area where the, the dirt is not close to the foundation. So I've been watering it for the past month. Someone said put sand there and what kind of sand I need to get. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, well, watering it first is a good idea because it settles in the sand, excuse me, the soil. So if there's any pockets, uh, air pockets, the dirt will fill it in so you won't have the soil continuing to, to fall down into any voids. 
Um, I'm not sure I would put sand though. I think you just have to put more soil, more topsoil. And I don't know how much it's six inch area, if, even if it's pretty long area, I would put in some sand, excuse me, some soil, not sand, compact, because sand is it, it get washed away by water from the rain or your gutters or whatever. So I would pack it with, backfill it with soil and, and then it put mulch or if you want to plant something to help stabilize it. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I was calling on a bathroom repair. I got two bathtubs back to back, wall up against between them, and both of the bathtubs don't drain. The pipes are over 30 years old. I'm going to have the main lines relined, but I want to make sure whether or not I can redo the trap and stuff in the ground for the pubs and redo the bathtub. Any tips? I'd appreciate it. Well, it sounds like if neither of the bathtubs are draining, there is something wrong with the drain. It's the the lines under the house, and it sounds like you're on a slab. So probably digging up the slab underneath the bathtubs and inspecting the existing trap, most likely you will need to replace it with a new trap um, in the ground um, while you're redoing your main line. Yeah, I mean, if he's on a slab, nobody wants to hear, well, you got to chop out the concrete yeah. to, to get to the, to the plumbing, but... You know, that's what happens when you when you live on a slab um, as opposed to a wood frame. If you're on a basement or crawl space, of course, you can get, always get underneath it. I want to remind you that um, first, if you if you want to be part of the show, you can always call our hotline 24 seven. It's 800-946-4420, which is the Today's Homeowner Hotline. You can leave us an email um, or you can go to email at todayshomeowner.com slash ask. And I also want to remind you of all the social media ways that you can reach us. We have the Today's Homeowner Facebook page, Pinterest, Instagram, and don't forget about our completely free newsletter. Um, it comes to you each week, each, excuse me, every other week, and you can sign up at todayshomeowner.com. And I want to mention that we don't use your name. We don't sell the email address or anything. You only hear from us. You'll get fresh information that you can use around the house each and every week. All right. Now Julie is joining us from Wyoming. Hi, Julie. Hi. Um, I was hoping you might have some tips for how to keep the snow from piling up in front of my entrance of my house. Um, in the winter, it seems like my house is acting like a large snow fence. Um, right. the, the snow comes in from the north and the west when the wind blows, and I think it's blowing off of the roof of my house, and then it piles up on the east end of the home, and okay. we have we kind of have an extension off that side where I have a, a door coming in. Um, from the south, and, and the snow just piles up right in front of that. And he didn't right. know if there was anything I could do. Well, um, first, um, is this a, a one- or two-story house? It's one story. One story. Okay. Whew, that's a good one. Not, now yeah. I have an answer for you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, actually, the, and, and the roof is asphalt shingles, I assume, or do you have metal it roof? Is. Okay, it is good. asphalt, yeah. Well, th there are a couple of different options. One, you could, there, there are things called snow guards and snow rails, which I see here in New England. Snow guards are simply, it's a little hard to explain, but they're little L-shaped pieces of metal that you, they're three or four inches wide and three or four, two or three inches tall, and you put them on your roof in different places. In this case, you'd put it on the roof near the, above where the door is. And the idea is that snow will pile up against these and not slide off as easily. In a snow rail, there's one called ACE clamp, A-C-E, ACE clamp that I'm familiar with. That is okay. essentially the same thing, but it's literally a metal rail that you can put on, and that holds even more snow, much more okay. snow than the roof guard. But I tell you what I do um, over our front. I just bought a roof rake, or sometimes it's called a, a snow rake, uh -huh. and it's literally that. You rake the snow off your roof, which sounds like a job nobody wants to do. I kind of enjoy it because I love the snow. But the mm -hmm. point is, it's a long handle thing with a, a blade on it. It's about two feet wide and six feet high and has little rollers on the bottom so you don't mess up your roof. And you basically just pull the snow off the roof. Now, mm -hmm. you're going to be pulling it off onto your in front of your doorway, but then you can easily shovel it off. Mm -hmm. And and what I do is if I know we're getting like 18 inches of snow, I'll go out there two or three times. I won't try pulling off 18 inches of snow, although it does work because once that snow starts sliding, it'll come right off the roof. So the, the one I bought was from a company called Garlic. I think it's pronounced it's G-A-R-E-L-I-C-K, Garlic. Uh -huh. And it's a 21-foot aluminum snow rake. And I bought two extra extension handles because this one was 21 foot and I wanted a little longer, so I bought two more 
extension handles. Uh-huh. Um, and they just snaps together, and you just go outside and just pull the snow off the roof. It's really as simple as that. Uh-huh. Um, well, and I didn't know if it was um, – I don't see a lot of snow on the top of the roof. It, right. I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's coming around the house and, and circling in. But, well, um, then – you had mentioned the term snow fence. I mean, you could, if it is coming around the house for some reason, I mean, you could put something up like a fence in mm-hmm. front of the um, porch or front door, the front step. Now, the way a snow fence works, though, is a true snow fence. There's space. It's basically slats for people who aren't familiar with. It's wooden slats about four feet tall, and they're spaced maybe two or three inches apart. And you might think, well, what, how much snow can it stop if it's two or three inches apart? But what it is, it's an easier way and a cheaper way to build this fence. But you don't set it right up. In your case, you wouldn't set it right close to the the porch because some snow will blow through the snow fence. So you usually put it four to six feet away. And you'd be surprised how much snow that would block. Um, and that would that would prevent it. Now, it's, it's only four feet high. So if the snow mm-hmm. is blowing in from six feet high, you know, I'm not sure what I could tell you, but mm-hmm. but I would say either put up some sort of barrier like a snow fence, um, mm-hmm. if that's the issue. If it's coming down off the roof, then you're going to have to remove it or with a rake or try holding mm-hmm. it in place with those guards okay. or the snow rails. Great. Okay. Well, thank you. Do you notice anybody else in your neighborhood? I mean, you're in Wyoming. You get a lot of snow. How do your neighbors um, deal uh, with it? Do they have I a similar problem? I think their houses are sitting at a different angle ah, in, in that case. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, I don't know. They don't seem to comp- have, of course, we never talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. well I, hope, I hope those ideas will help you, Julie. You know that you're just getting into the, the snowy season up there. and um, Yeah, um, I'm trying to get ready for that. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank, well, thank, you, thank so you for calling. If we, if we can help you any other way, get back in touch with us. All right. Thanks. You're welcome. Wow. That, yeah, they get a lot of snow up there. I am Chelsea Lipford Wolf sitting in Danny Lipford's chair. It's quite cozy. So thank you for having me. And um, this is my favorite part of the show. It's a simple solution that some, you know, sometimes the best solutions are the simplest. And we're so glad to have Joe Truini share a simple solution with us. And now it's time for a new one. Joe, what do you have for us? Well, thank you, Chelsea. Yes, this one is how to lay out a pathway. So let's say you're putting in a brick pathway or even a gravel pathway. It could be almost anything, even a concrete one. And usually you want, you know, a nice straight one isn't always practical. So you want it or attractive. So you want a nice curved S shape or serpentine shape. So how do you lay it out to get an idea of the shape? Mm -hmm. Well, here's a really simple one. And you're going to use a garden hose Ah. and some and some flour, some white flour mm. from the pantry. Mm. All right, how's that? Okay. That might pique your interest. <laughs> so all you need to do is you just stretch out the hose along the area where you want to build a pathway, and you push it in and out, and you kind of shape the hose as you would want the shape of your pathway to be. And okay. it makes it really easy, of course, to adjust it. You know, maybe you want it more curved or less curved. But anyway, you get it to where it looks pretty pleasing to you. Then you can just sprinkle white flour along the hose to mark its position, obviously, on the ground. Or you can also use um, line marking spray paint right. to make mm-hmm. this special spray paint that you know sprays upside down. And you just spray along the hose, and, and then you can move the hose. And then for the other side of the, hall, of the pathway, you can basically just measure in several places off, you know, off the curve just to, to replicate it. And then you can put the hose in place again and, again, make measurements and mark it again either with the flower or with the paint then you move the hose out of the way and you have this perfect outline which you then would of course dig out start the digging grass. yeah right start digging um and and that is first of all you can create exactly what you want but more importantly you can have it start and end exactly where it needs to be which often right. is like the door and the driveway okay. and if you need to go around a tree or you need to whatever you know you can you can customize it and and I've used this several times. It works really great. So next time you're laying out anything like that, you know, try using a garden hose. Yeah, perfect for laying out flower beds, too. I know I have yeah, some that's curvy right. flower, like, you know, between the the mulch and the grass gives you a place to know where to start it. Yeah, because, you know, you know like I said, those straight paths, they're easy to build. They're really not, <laughs> not that all attractive, to tell you the truth. There's something pleasing about walking oh, up definitely. kind of a curved path and in the curves when you have those the inside of the curve it's the perfect place to set 
a small shrub. Right. Or yeah. Plant I was thinking the same like thing. That. Yeah. 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 So, and we shot a video of this that you can find online. There are almost 500. In fact, Danny and I were talking about last week when we shoot the 500th Simple Solution, which is coming up I think next month. I'm coming down to Mobile, ah, Chelsea. So okay. I'll see you. We'll shoot some more. Um, we're going to have a special list of maybe my 10 favorite simple solutions. Oh, that'd be and, fun, um, yeah. And we'll, we'll put them, we'll, we'll have Brandon list them on, on the website and uh, so everybody can take a look at them. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This one comes in from Kentucky. Yeah, Delbert writes, I have an old log home that I rebuilt around 1980. Some of the logs are dry rotting. Do you have any helpful hints that would help me in restoring the logs? They were originally used in a log hotel in Aberdeen, Ohio, and we brought them to Morning View, Kentucky in 1977. My wife and I worked and rebuilt our home and moved into the home in 1982. Thank you so much for your interesting programs. Talk about interesting. That sounds like an interesting project, right? these logs. What a story these logs could tell. They've been moved around state to state. Um, I've not actually um, tried salvaging old rotted logs, but I know this, the, there's a product that's referred to as CPES, which simply stands for Clear Penetrating Epoxy Sealer. Um, now, Dubber doesn't mention how rotted these are right. and where they're rotted. Often they rot like just on the ends. Uh -huh. So sometimes they're in the middle. I'm not sure. But but if he looked up clear penetrating epoxy seal, that's probably his best option. Now, sometimes you can inject this into rotted wood and it stabilizes it. Right. And then you can put an epoxy filler, you know, if there's a void to fill it. There's um, a method called drill and fill where if you know the inside of the log where it's rotted, oh, you drill a hole and you yeah. fill it with the epoxy and you inject it in there. Um, and the great thing about these epoxies is they're not as thick as most epoxies, Chelsea, right. and that they soak into the wood. The wood, of course, is super porous, especially uh, if, it's if it's dry, really old, dry, yeah. and rotted. So it soaks it up and then um, stops the rot you know, hardens. in its spot. Stops in the spotlight. Delbert, are you listening? <laughs> Chelsea's that's the help he needed. So that's what he might need is that clear penetrating epoxy seal. It's not cheap. So hopefully he doesn't need a lot of it. But it's the the only other option in some cases would be to replace the logs. And I don't know or section the log. And that sounds like it'd be almost impossible to do. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I'm not. I've never. They don't just sell those on the side of the road. <laughs> no, <laughs> but you know, this is the kind of thing where you know, Delbert. It might be a lot of work. It might take cost a few dollars, maybe more than you care to spend, but you know, to save a project like this, it's going to be well worth it in the end. So, so check out that epoxy sealer. I think that might be your best option for saving these logs. If you've got a question, you can submit it to todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. We're so thankful for the thousands of subscribers we have, including all the new ones that are joining us all the time. Yeah, we would really appreciate if you enjoy our podcast to leave us a rating and a review um, wherever you listen to the podcast so that more people can find us and our fun home improvement content. Thanks again. We'll see you next week.